Professor Stein, in the first two interviews, we covered various aspects of your life at Aberdeen and Cambridge. Today, I'd like to discuss aspects of your published scholarly work, and I've had a chance to look at 11 of your books, written over the period 1958 to 1999. I have these books with me here, but it will not be practical for us to look at each book, so perhaps we can discuss some general themes. And the themes I suggest we follow are A, the categories of books you've written, B, your literary style and technique, and C, a few general topics that form a background to some of your works. So if we can start with the categories, and for convenience, perhaps we can consider that your books fall into two broad divisions. Firstly, books in which you presented your thoughts and conclusions on Roman law per se, and secondly, books which are themselves archives of documents that had a bearing on the development of legal ideas, and we can look at these as primary sources. So starting with Roman law, and there are four books which I suspect represent a crystallisation of the bulk of your ideas and thoughts over 20 years, from 1966 to 1984, and they were The Rules or Maxims Book of 1966, Legal Values, 1974, Legal Evolution, 1980, and Legal Institutions, 1984. Which of these four books, Professor Stein, would you consider your most important work? I, I always think that's perhaps the, the one that I'm most proud of. You, you, the juristic rules to legal maxims? Yes. Actually, Professor Ibbotson agrees with you. Oh. Yes. Uh, why do you say that that is your most important well, book? Strictly speaking, it's not for me to say that. <laughs> but if, uh, if you, I, I would say that there's more sort of original work in this than in, in, in any other book. Professor Stein, do you remember why you wrote each of them? I mean, the first one, for example, your most important one, Juristic Rules to Legal Maxims. Well, the first one was my PhD, which must be somewhere false in the formation of contract. Yes. And I can tell you what, and that was because um, I, I was only qualified in England when I went to Aberdeen, and they expected me to have some sort of Scottish qualification. And originally I thought, well, I could be a an advocate in Scotland uh, and still be a solicitor in England, but apparently you can't. Uh, there was some sort of local um, pact between the two professions and I didn't want to give up being an English solicitor so that I could be called to the bar in Scotland so that um, I gave up that idea. Professor Stein, your last book, The European yes. Roman Law and European History in 1999, was written when you retired. Is it true to say that this was perhaps a backward glance over your life's work? Well, it was a distillation of the result of the LLB, as it was then course that I gave on uh, European legal history. Um, it summarise. Yes, I mean, I, I uh, Why did you write, decide to write this book? Well, because there really was nothing in English. A lot of books were on Roman law, but they all stopped at Justinian, and uh, I thought this was uh, arbitrary. I didn't see why one should stop uh, studying Roman law uh, just with the corpus juris. I mean, that was one stage, obviously. And in some countries, like Italy, the um, professors of Roman law don't 
teach anything after Justinian because uh, medieval and uh, Renaissance developments are uh, covered by professors of legal history who are sort of separate category but um, that was a purely a tel- local division and I didn't uh, I was not in any way bound by that. You mentioned in the last interview that choosing pictures for the German version was something you enjoyed very much. Oh, yes. yes. (laughs) And if there is time, I'd love to come back to this at the end of the interview and ask you about these pictures, if I may. Uh, Why don't we do that now? um, This first one. Justinian. Yeah. Did you simply choose that because? Well, it's a very popular one. And this one here, Professor Stein. Yeah. Do you recall choosing this, the Digestum Novum? No, just we just I just wanted a, an example of a manuscript copy with a, a sort of embellishment. Very, it's very attractive. Yes, I like this one very much. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the students in was this in Bologna. Yes, it was. <clears throat> Seems that one of them is falling asleep. Yes. I was having had a bit of bother with that. That's in the law faculty in Paris. And uh, whoever took the photograph was was a professor of Roman law um, whose name escapes me at the moment. Thank you. But, yeah. I like this one very much as well. Oh yes. Seems to be very somewhat humorous. Yes. Did you, did you did you remember choosing this one? Yes. Well, a, a lot of them are published, um, and uh, I, I got the book with the whole series at home. I can imagine you pouring over them with great enjoyment. Yes, uh, that's right. <laughs> and then, finally, this one, which is the Vinius Castigatus. Uh, yes. Is this a volume that you have in your personal library? Uh, yes, I think so. Yes. And oh, no, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't think I do have. Professor Stein, still talking about your books on Roman law, your PhD, that's the only one I don't have here because someone has borrowed it from the library, it's not on the shelf, Um, your first published work, what were the circumstances of its publication? Was it not unusual in those days to publish a PhD? No, well, the, the, um, the, the law faculty in Scotland wanted it because they wanted me to show the title says in Roman law and Scots law uh-huh. and that's why that's the only thing I've ever well, the only book anyway but deals at all with Scots law and uh, they wanted me to prove that I had some sort of qualification in Scots law um, that's interesting your second published book in 1963 was, strikes me as a mammoth undertaking. It was the updating oh, no, of the Buckland well, book. Not really. Um, because I... Um, the the um, paperback is now out. Ah, I, 
I noticed, in fact, that there's a new printing coming out in 2009. No, it's, it's out. It's out. Just about right. a month ago. Thank you. Hmm. Click on that. It's just, it's just a reprint of this. And uh, the, the trouble is the press said they weren't going to reset it. I could, I could make any changes I wanted provided that I kept exactly the same length oh. so that they, they printed it line by line and stuck in the, you know, a, a, a line here and a line there. Let's see. When you were in Virginia in 1979, you produced a volume of your lecture notes and I have that here. This must have been a huge amount of work, Professor Stein. It's a sizable volume. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah. History of the European Civil Law? I was showing this to Professor Ibbotson about a month ago and he was very interested in it. Yeah. What a useful compilation for Well, it was students. a sort of preliminary for that, I suppose. Right. But I, 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 I mean, I was limited by the fact that these were really like handouts mm. to the class and they, um, they had to be in English. So the materials I had to select uh, from works that were either written in English or translated. Mm. Your collected essays published in 1988 was a collection, as the name suggests, of your essays. Yes, I, I selected those. Because oh. the, the Hamilton Press um, were doing quite a lot of these books. I mean, they've got it for Toby Millison and John Baker and everybody. So I, I just... But I didn't, uh, I could have done one for Roman law, but I preferred to do it, uh, you know, he's got more and more, I've been thinking that the neglected aspect of Roman law was post-Justinian mm. and uh, the medieval and uh, Renaissance Roman law had got a rather poor deal. They, they hadn't been uh, <coughs> properly represented in published and reprinted work. I shall return to one of these later. I very much enjoyed reading Sir Thomas Smith. The Renaissance <laughs> Civilian, the most beautiful piece of this is done. Very moving. In fact, I chose a quotation from that essay as a preface to um, a little course I do for the first years in printed sources. Oh. Yes. A um, lovely piece refers to the donation of books to Queen's. This time, that brings me then to your archiving projects. This is a fascinating aspect of your career, and I'm referring here to Adam Smith's lectures. Is I, I was asked because Adam Smith a lot, a lot of references to ancient law, and uh, so. I, I, I had to be one of the editors, but it, it had been done before, really, and so the war wasn't as hard as it might appear. One could almost see this as the production of primary resources, yeah. in that you were making them available 
first time to others. Yeah. Now, with this particular one, Professor Stein, this, the Adam Smith book was done in collaboration with others. I yeah, noticed that your name is third. Yeah, but, um, Meek, you see, he did the text. Um, Uh, because it had never been printed before. So what role did you play in this project? Well, I had to identify where the sources that Adam Smith used as far as I could. This must have entailed a great deal of detective work. Well, a certain amount, yes. Yes, please. I'm very fascinated by the 12th century manuscript. And. Yes, and that involved more work. Yes, uh, that was my my sense. Um, just to establish the provenance. And great scholarship is displayed here, Professor Stein. C- can you recount the circumstances of how. Professor De Zilueta came to involve you with well, the you see, manuscript. He was a great admirer of Dauber, my teacher. When Dauber went to Aberdeen, uh, there were hardly any books on Roman law in the Aberdeen Library, but the people there said they would spend money on it. And uh, so um, De Zilueta offered to sell, but at a very low price, uh, his Roman law books to Aberdeen Library. And uh, as a result of that, uh, he used to occasionally write to to Dauber, saying, will you look up this in my book? (laughs) And uh, uh, he wrote to me when I succeeded Dauber up there. And uh, I think I mentioned this in the in, in, in the preface. Can you say how this work differed in in the mental and the practical demands from your other work? Well, if if it did indeed differ. Well, it, 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 I, I, it's not connected with any particular course that I give, so I never taught, as it were, medieval Roman law. But um, I had to translate, <laughs> the, the English was... It's really fascinating. And you think, I mean, a scholar such as Vicarius must also have been a fairly competent politician as well. Yes, there's still a lot of mystery about vicarious. I mean, I put forward the theory in, in this book that he, he gave lectures in Lincoln because I said Lincoln was um, in a quite near way. He was a priest in charge at um, Subtle in uh, Nottinghamshire. Hmm. And uh, presumably there aren't any pictures of him. Oh no. No. I mean, it was about 1200. Yes. You must have enjoyed this archiving project, Professor Stein. Yes, I, I'd never thought of it as archiving. <laughs> Excavating, and presumably you were you went to Italy. Yes, well, I, I um, you know, I had to be away, out of the country, for tax reasons, <laughs> and so I was in Italy. 
I worked in uh, in Florence. They kept the old books down in the basement, and uh, persuaded them to give me, to lend me the key. So. Uh, I wonder whether you've perhaps gone to Rome to any of the sort of Vatican collections. No. Yeah. Florence. No, I've always been happier in the northern Italy. That's where I studied originally. Yes. Um, Pavia. That brings me to your literary style and techniques. From the earliest, 1958, to the latest, in 1999, reviewers have commented upon your extraordinary writing skills, Professor Stein, using adjectives such as elegant, lucid, succinct, stimulating, light touches. Oh, wow. These are skills all writers strive for. You do have a wonderfully engaging style and a great gift of presenting ideas clearly. If I can take a particular attribute in your collected essays, which I have here, there's an article entitled Elegance in Law. It's a wonderful piece. Yeah, it was a lecture I gave in Oxford. Was it? It was a challenge. David Dalber once said, I challenge you to write, to give a lecture on elegance. I said, okay. This was a, a light motif throughout your career, elegance? Well, I, I didn't think of it that way. So these qualities that are so much admired, your writing skills, did they come naturally or did you have to work hard to achieve them? Well, I suppose, well, I, I suppose they're natural up to the point. Do you think that you improved with years? I hope so. <laughs> also, all reviewers comment on your great depth of knowledge. Thoughtful, thought-provoking, deep insight. Well, I tried to be clear. I once said in a lecture that it's more important to be clear than even to be right. Uh -huh. um, you also, you regularly consulted original sources. Mm, well, I think you have a duty to. And the other thing that strikes me is that you must have done very extensive refining of your Latin from an early age. Well. I mean, to some extent, if you hadn't been so good at Latin, you might have followed a different yes, I, path. Yes, uh, I would have chosen things differently, but... So it seems to me that there was a very intense period of study right at the beginning of your career. No, well, I, I, uh, I was a classicist at school, and uh, it was a classical exhibition at but I've always preferred Latin to Greek. I don't know why. It was perhaps your Latin that brought you under the gaze of Dalba. Yes, well. In your bibliographic introduction to the Buckland update, yes. you mentioned on page 24 that Dalba used the technique of form criticism, yes. which was used by biblical scholars. Did he teach it to you, Professor Stein? Well, he was my PhD supervisor, and he talked to me a bit about, about form criticism. He had learned it from biblical scholars in Göttingen and, um, and he explained to me in English what it entailed. And do you recall that? <coughs> what? 
what he told you about the technique? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, he did it. I sort of gave me a few examples. Mm. Did, did was it something that you ever utilised in your writing? Um, very occasionally, I suppose. I didn't think of it much, but can't really help you much <laughs> on that. Coming to the general topics that run through your yes. work, perhaps I can pick on two recurrent themes. The problem of interpolations. This was a preoccupation of early researchers and scholars, and it was something with which you appear to have had little sympathy. You refer to interpolation hunting. Yes. You mention it in Buckland. Yes, um, well, it was very, very popular in the 30s before the war. But um, I, I, uh, people rather lost interest in it. You also mention in your essay on German emigres on of how Schultz was obsessed with it. Yes. A rather amusing account in that essay. And you refer to it in your European history book on page 129. It is um, the excesses of interpolation uh, hunting. Oh, yes. Made the study of Roman law seem to many non specialists yes. generous and esoteric sport. Well, I think it's, it's uh, in general a rather bad influence because. Um, you concluded that it was probably best to take Justinian as a faithful record. Well, yes, I mean, obviously. I mean, so it's always been recognised that the um, compilers of the digest must have made certain changes. The question is to what extent they actually rewrote a lot of the stuff. That brings me to a second theme, which is Scottish law, which you spent a lot of your time researching and writing on, starting in your PhD. Yeah. Was this originally just an accident of your having been at Aberdeen? Well, no, I was <laughs> encouraged there to sort of justify my position. As I said, mm. Uh, in a Scots law faculty I had to have some sort of Scottish qualification and the PhD with and Scots law <laughs> in the title was my my uh, claim so uh, well do you think you would have come to Scots law in any event uh, no, I don't think so. Lawson <coughs> in Oxford was um, in, interested in Scots law. Because, of course, Oxford came as one of the few places that had sources for Scots law, as well as English law. And uh, uh, they had it. They taught it. Perhaps it was your interest in legal theory and Scots law that drew you to the Enlightenment. Oh well, yes. It was really the um, Adam Smith having to work on Adam Smith, and that was where I was just asked to join the editors, the two others, because the man who actually discovered the Adam Smith notes was at Aberdeen, he was in the English department. Why 
one of the reviewers, Cairns, <coughs> commenting on your collected essays, says that you were the only person to have done serious research on the Enlightenment in recent years. Well, that must have been a while ago he wrote that. Because um, he's done quite a lot to stimulate interest in the Enlightenment. But you were one of the first, Professor Stein, to take an interest in it. Well, maybe, yes. Would you say that it requires a Roman law background to do it properly? Yes, I think so. No, I've never thought of one as a preparation for the other. I am. Um, no. I suspect that your going to Aberdeen was a crucial point. Yes, that was uh, Dalva wanted. He needed an assistant, and because he taught me in in Cambridge, and uh, you know was uh, supervising my PhD from the time I arrived in Aberdeen, he um, it perhaps led you to doors that you otherwise might not have knocked at. Maybe yes. A very certainly a very great influence upon your your work. What was David Dalber? Oh yes, oh very much so. Looking back on your career, Professor Stein, what would you say is has been the highlight? You mean in terms of your academic achievements? Work. Well, I mean, I always think this book regularly years. Yes. That one. But you see, since then, I mean, that's really Roman law. And since then, uh, it's always been sort of offshoots of Roman law. Roman law itself. But, you see, I want to say that, um, <laughs> what, what, what did I just say? But, uh, you know, jurisprudence, uh, or the sort of theory of, of law, was um, tied with Roman law in Aberdeen, the name of the chair was jurisprudence. I was professor of jurisprudence. And uh, if, if I, I had to teach both Roman law and uh, jurisprudence at, at Aberdeen, and I was external examiner here in Cambridge while I was professor in Aberdeen for jurisprudence, as well as occasionally for Roman law. But uh, I've always thought of myself as primarily a Romanist rather than a Jewish prude. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Professor oh, not Stein. not at all. It's been extremely interesting.